welcome to the Monday edition of DC Today. It's going to be a very oil, energy heavy uh, talk. I do want to cover as many of the other things as I can, but I've got to tell you that the dctoday.com, you're going to get a lot more info today than normal um, just because there were a lot of different things I wanted to cover. And I want to spend the time I have for this uh, podcast and video focused on the rather earth-shattering news that came in Sunday in energy markets and certainly affected equity markets today. The Dow closed up 327 points. That comes after it being up over 1,000 points last week. It's been a monstrous rally here to finish the month of March. And yet today's rally was led by the energy sector up almost 5% just today, 4.91% in the S&P energy sector. And you had four sectors that were actually negative, including real estate that was down almost 1%. The NASDAQ itself was down 27 basis points. So you didn't have a broad risk on rally like we did have several days last week. You had something a little bit more uh, particular, selective. And again, energy was the reason. And that comes from the news we're going to discuss in a second. Uh, The S&P was kind of in between there. It was up 37 basis points, so not negative like the NASDAQ, but not up 1% like the Dow. Um, The bond market rallied today. Uh, The tenure itself was down another 7 or 8 basis points, closed somewhere around the 3.4% range. So you take the first quarter of 2023, today being the very first day of the second quarter, and the bond market was up 3.2%. That's the index that combines both both government and investment-grade corporate bonds. Uh, By the way, the the Dow was up 1% last quarter. The S&P was up 7. The NASDAQ was up 16, as you had some of the recovery from the bloodbath that had taken place in some of those sectors late last year. Um, Emerging markets were up 4% in Q1, and the Russell 2000, which is small cap companies, were up 2.3%. So between all the fury of the Fed tightening and all the fury of recession coming and all the fury of banks failing, uh, well, it doesn't appear to have been caught on to risk markets where virtually every risk-oriented equity index we track was up and certainly uh, the bond market was up. Um, That's kind of the story for Q1. I mean, I think that the market being a leading indicator means to me it's not a huge surprise, but I think it's kind of weird because some might argue that the market's now leading something that would be um, way out in advance because there could be much more distress ahead. And, And a few weeks ago, I mean, not a few months ago or a few quarters ago, like a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the um, breakage in the global financial system. And yet risk assets are continuing to rally. The issue that brought up energy 5% today was OPEC Plus's announcement yesterday that they're going to be cutting starting on May 1, 1 million, a little over 1 million barrels per day from production through the end of the year. Saudi Arabia committing to 500,000 of that uh, 1 million alone. Um, Now, we could say it was even more than that because Russia's talking about taking 500,000 a day offline as well. But that was already kind of priced in. And so I'm not counting that. I'm netting that out when we get to the 1.1 million barrels per day. Russia hasn't been producing up to that quota level anyways. So there was no reason to include that as a cut from a number that didn't really exist. Um, Why are they doing it? Well, there's simply no question that they want to set a floor more like 80 than like 60 or 65. And they believe that the uh, demand levels have not picked up to where current supply levels are going to rationalize a price between 80 and 100. Uh, Thus far, I'm going to write more about this in Dividend Cafe this week. That's sort of my plan right now to have a Thursday Dividend Cafe. By the way, markets are closed Friday for Good Friday. 
to have a Thursday Dividend Cafe with a lot more unpacking of the real story going on here, which I think is a China-Saudi accord playing out in world energy markets. But the million barrels per day that even I believe is necessary and additional demand with China reopening, there's no question that has not materialized yet. Maybe it will later. Maybe the million itself was overthought and overestimated. Um, the, there's no surprise it would need to be more of a ramp up, particularly with the heavy COVID infections after the reopening that were uh, necessary as the, they kind of begun some process of normalization. But I think there's some other reasons, too, that it might be more uh, prudent to suspect that that million barrels a day of additional demand was overthought and overestimated. And therefore, uh, with the U.S. production levels lagging and consumption, uh, the demand levels not going to a whole other stratosphere, that uh, the production is not going to warrant um, those price levels. And I think that OPEC Plus is basically saying, we're not gonna let the US be the marginal buyer that dictates a $65, $70 price. And uh, they flooded the world with uh, 180 million barrels of excess supply via the release from Strategic Petroleum Reserve that worked for their, uh, meaning uh, American, consumption needs, but but it did so at the effect of taking 10 to $20 out of the price, which uh, came straight from OPEC Plus's margin. So therefore, two can play at this game. So that is, to me, what I believe they're thinking. It was a completely gangster move, uh, shocking. And yet, I am for the life of me trying to figure out what the leverage is that their foes have to uh, fight back at it. I don't believe there is any. And so I think Saudi is moving towards a very deep and substantial partnership with China um, that I want to elaborate on in Dividend Cafe. But when we're talking about Saudi putting $3.6 billion, uh, U.S. dollars, that's grown-up money, into what will be one of the largest oil refineries in the world in China and committing to running 500,000 barrels per day from Saudi production to this China refinery um, in a strategic joint venture with China. This is serious, uh, uh, I think, um, sign of where this, the geopolitical and the economic alliance is headed. So allow me to elaborate more on it, but understand it for what it is. There's very little U.S. can do. It puts the big U.S. producers in a very attractive spot whereby they're already global players to begin with. And now without having to increase production, take extra capex risk, they benefit from higher margins, from higher dollars, and yet don't have to increase volumes at a time where there's so many extrinsic forces fighting against higher volumes domestically. It's just it's just utterly crazy. So uh, that was the scoop today in the energy market, which really kind of spilled over into all equity markets. And um, on Friday, the inflation data did indicate more downward pressure on the PCE, which is the personal consumption expenditures index that the Fed likes even more than the CPI. Now looking at goods inflation that is up 3.6% year over year, it had been 10.6%. So that's the kind of disinflation we're talking about from 10 down to 3, uh, giving you a core PCE rate of goods and services at 4.6%. There's still, in my mind, excess froth in there on housing, but it's not nearly as bad as it is in the CPI number where the lag effect of housing measurement is far worse. That number will come out here in the next uh, couple of weeks. So that's the, sto- the story with inflation, the oil markets, the geopolitics, Q1 in review, and I just want to let you know the back by popular demand against doomsdayism is in the dctoday.com, and if the idea that the uh, invention of penicillin saving 203 million lives in the last 90 years does not cause you to take a little pause at pathological pessimism, I don't know what will, 
Go to thedctoday.com for more of uh, elaboration on all these things. We'll, we'll come back to you tomorrow with another uh, DC Today podcast video and reading. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful evening. And may your final uh, college basketball team selection win.